Brass in Pocket was the first new number one single of the 80s. And what a better way to kick off the new decade of music than with a song that combines the influence of several genres that came before it and creates something entirely new. The Pretenders and their hit song, Brass in Pocket, have inspired so much music from new wave, post-punk, pop, and beyond. But the song almost didn't get released. Today, we're going to talk about the history behind this song, break down the musical elements, and see how Brass in Pocket changed music. Hello there, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Welcome back to another episode of Songs That Changed Music. If you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the notification bell, and you'll be notified when we have another new video. Of course, you can also go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. Brass in Pocket is a unique combination of elements. It's part pop, part rock, and almost has a Motown feeling. It mixes a great guitar riff with a laid back groove from the drums and bass. Lyrically, it is a mix of confidence and swagger with some British slang. And the unique singer of the band, Chrissy Hind, is an American with the rest of the band being British. And to top it off, Chrissy Hind didn't like the song and didn't want it to be released. After changing her mind, Brass in Pocket quickly became a huge hit, putting the Pretenders on the map. Today, we're going to explore all of these elements and more and break down why this song is so incredible. The best place to start, of course, is with James Honeyman Scott's guitar riff. So this is James Honeyman Scott, one of my favorite guitar players of this period, just a really amazing innovator. What I really love about this song is the tension between the electric guitar and the bass. So it starts off with this beautiful open chord idea where he's hammering on to a suspended fourth but with an open B and an open E. And you get this, and the open A, of course. As you can tell again, chorus. Um, I'm using a clone theory. It was probably a chorus ensemble, or it could have been, of course, a JC120. This is a very popular sound of this period, and if you want to reproduce this late 70s, early 80s guitar sounds, go for the JC120, or go for a CE2 or a chorus ensemble. It will give you that sound immediately. Now, the tension is really fun because James is playing this part in the verse. <laughs> And Pete Farnham is playing an A the whole time. So you get. But then as it comes to the pre-chorus, he goes down to an F sharp and he gets this beautiful tension. Because an F sharp over that first one, it starts off like a minor seven, but then the second chord is a fourth in it. So a little bit of a suspension there. But then it's beautiful on the last chord because, of course, the F sharp gives you this D major triad to F sharp minor. So it's beautiful. And that's just with the F sharp. Then at the end of that phrase, it goes to James playing on the A chord, again using the shape. But and Pete goes and plays a D. And an E, so it's like a four, five climb. It's really tasty going back into, you guessed it, the A. So there's nothing predictable about this. I mean, it's a nice chord sequence, which is sort of familiar, but it's, it's all the tensions between the guitar and the bass. So the end of this verse, um, pre-chorus, I suppose, it changes to this. And what I love about that is Pete is playing an E the whole time. So he's playing a five, which is like a setup. You're dying to hear the one chord, which of course is the A. And here it is interesting because of course it's, that's basically the top part of an E, if you like. It's, it's the, a five and a one of an E. But it's suspended because you've got the six on it. So you've got this. Just a great suspension. And then of course here, the sus four. I just think it's really harmonically interesting and rich. I mean, you know, this was a time of punk and post-punk and everybody was like, 
playing chords and stuff like this. And here they've got these like just really cool pieces of tension going on. And it gets even better because when it goes to the chorus, Pete the bass player holds down a G. And James Honeyman Scott is playing a B minor. So you get this. But you have the G in the bass. So yeah, you get a really beautiful major seventh chord. Absolutely gorgeous. And then it goes to the D shape. And of course, Pete at that point is playing a D, but then it keeps on that shape when Pete goes down to the A. Which, you know, it works because it could be the five of the chord, but it, it creates this really, really cool interest. Just a great, great song. Really, you know, simple, I suppose. It's not like, you know, shredding all over the place, but it's just really harmonically, really, really interesting. And, you know, it was no surprise. It was a great hit. And really, for me, just exemplifies all of the cool things about James Honeyman Scott. Although he only got better. I mean, the next album he did was even better still, just incredible guitar playing. So James Honeyman Scott wrote this riff and Chrissy Hyde provided the lyrics and the melody to it. The term brass in pocket is, it's a British slang for having money in the pocket of your pants. Or, as we like to say in the UK, in the pocket of your trousers. It is a little phrase Chrissy heard and immediately loved it. The song was a breakthrough for the band. It was their third single, but their first number one hit. The song would not be the same and wouldn't even have been released without the help of the legendary producer, Mr. Chris Thomas. The Pretenders released two other singles before Brass in Pocket. The first was a cover of the Kink song, Stop Your Sobbing, followed by the band's own original, Kit. They were both released in early 1979, and despite charting at number 34 and number 33 respectively, not everyone was happy where the band was headed. After producing Stop Your Sobbing, producer Nick Lowe, who was huge at the time and was doing everybody's records, decided not to work with the Pretenders again because, as he said, this group's not going anywhere, I'm not gonna work with them again. Fortunately for the Pretenders, they had already caught another producer's ear. Chris Thomas was already very well known for his work with Pink Floyd, Roxy Music, the Sex Pistols, Paul McCartney, and Pete Townsend. And he knew Chrissy Hyde from before she formed the Pretenders. Chrissy is originally from Akron, Ohio, and moved to London in 1973. She worked for the music magazine NME at Malcolm McLaren's clothing store and even tried to convince Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious to marry her so she could get a work permit. Chrissy Hine was already tied into the music scene, getting to know the musicians and the producers coming up at the time. She wanted to do more singing herself, so she asked for Chris Thomas's advice. He told her, you've got a great voice, but that's not really going to be enough. What you're going to have to do is write. You need to write and you need to get into a band. After hearing The Pretenders' first single, Stop Your Sobbing, on the radio, Chris Thomas was glad to hear Chrissy singing with the band. But he still wanted her to write her own music. Shortly after that, Chrissy sent him a demo of four songs, hoping to get him to produce them. One of those demo songs was Brass in Pocket, which Chris Thomas took particular interest in. He saw it as being like an almost Al Green type thing with Al Jackson drums on it. I spotted that song and thought that it was a single, but it was quite slow the way they did it and it needed a little bit more bounce to it. So let's take a listen to the original demo and see what Chris Thomas was referring to. God bless in pocket God battle As you can hear, all of the elements are there. The chords, the great guitar riff, Chris's incredible vocal, but it just needed a bit of polishing from a great producer. 
Unsatisfied with how dead sounding recording studio rooms were becoming, Chris Thomas recalls, I remember bringing a PA into Wessex for the Pretenders because it was so dead, it used to drive me crackers. So I used to put the drums through a PA just to give them some thump. They weren't going to allow me to rip the carpet off the floor. The final result, which we all know and love, is a bit faster, it sounds fuller, and the whole thing feels tighter while still being relaxed. We got this in pocket. We got battle. I am gonna use it. Intention. I'm feeling mental. Gonna make you, make you, make you naughty. Chris Thomas is not only a great producer. But more than that, he saw the potential Chrissy Hind had and wanted to see her succeed. He's responsible not only for the production on this song, but for guiding Chrissy Hind in her career. In the liner notes for the 1984 Pretenders album, Learning to Crawl, he even earned the title The Fifth Pretender. Now there's another element we have to talk about, the groove. Chrissy Hind didn't like how Brass in Pocket turned out because she said, I didn't think it knew what it was. It thought it sounded like it was trying to be a Motown song, but didn't quite get it. And she's kind of right. Is the song pop? Is it Motown? Is it rock? I mean, yes to all of those things. It's got this great hooky pop guitar riff, Chrissy's powerful rock influence vocal, but with a very Motown-esque background vocals and this drum and bass groove that just feels so good. The laid back drum groove paired with the driving eighth notes from the bass provide a solid feel that the rest of the song is built on. After hearing drummer Martin Chambers at the first rehearsal with the group, Chrissy Hind recalled, I had to turn around and face the wall. I was laughing so hard because as soon as Martin started playing with us, I knew this was it. We had the band. And Martin is such a great drummer. Martin Chambers had the unique job of not only playing this amazing groove, but also interpreting what Chrissy Hind wanted. He and bassist Pete Farnden had to work together to establish a groove, incorporating what he calls Chrissy's odd timing. Fortunately, he figured out how to work with her, providing a great groove on Brass in Pocket and many other songs after that. Martin Chambers recalls, once we made the adjustment and learned to go with her flow, so to speak, it became second nature. It's the bedrock of Pretenders music. All of these elements came together for an incredible song. It's got a cool, understated groove, that great guitar riff, and Chrissy Hines' incredible vocal. Chrissy Hines is one of the first female rockers of this era, making a statement of empowerment with this song. She's got a great voice, singing with a laid back confidence, and all of her incredible stage presence. The lyrics are about having the cool confidence to convince someone to notice her, and the music matches this idea perfectly. And in a sense, it worked. The confidence and the swagger of the song is exactly what got people to notice the Pretenders. Brass in Pocket was released in November of 1979, peaking at number one on the UK singles charts in January of 1980. Brass in Pocket became the first new number one of 1980, replacing Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall Part Two, which had been the Christmas number one. And what a better way to kick off the new decade of music than with a song that combines the influence of several genres that came before it and creates something entirely new. By May of 1980, Brass in Pocket had reached the US, peaking at number 14 on the Billboard charts. But before any of that happened, producer Chris Thomas had to convince Chrissy Hine to release the song. And even after it reached number one, Chrissy couldn't stand it. She recalls, I used to cringe when I heard my voice on those early Pretenders recordings. And then that pucker went to number one. I remember walking around Oxford Circus, hearing it blasting out of people's radios. I was mortified. It's not unusual for singers to hate the sound of their own voice. John Lennon famously loved doubling his own voice because he couldn't stand hearing it as a single track. Chrissy may have hated it, but the song wasn't going anywhere. The song was certified gold in the UK, platinum in the US, and it was one of the first music videos played on MTV when it was launched in August of 1981. More than chart numbers and accolades, producer Chris Thomas was happy with the end result of the album. Looking back on it proudly. More than anything else, you see, when we finished the record, we were so happy with it and so proud of the record. 
And I listened to it, and I thought, this is fantastic. I mean, every song's like a really good song. That's the most important thing about that album. It really held together. I mean, the material that was there was, was great. And that was it, really. I mean, yeah, I mean, the fact that it was number one, obviously, I mean, it's, it's a great feeling, but that goes pretty soon. I mean, that's just literally a phone call. Ten minutes later, you've burnt the toast, you know. Oh, Christ. But the fact that the record was a uh, satisfying record to make, that's always there. So you reflect on that more than anything else. The Pretenders' debut album has been named one of the greatest albums of all time by VH1, Rolling Stone, Slant Magazine, and in 2005, The Pretenders were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well, I, I know The Pretenders have looked like a tribute band uh, for the last 20 years. And actually, they are a tribute, tribute band, and, and uh, we're paying tribute tonight to James Honeyman Scott and Pete Farndon, without whom we wouldn't be here. It is personally one of my top 10 favorite albums of all time. I think it is the epitome of badass American girl with a British rock band backing her. It's just absolutely fantastic. It's got some punk rock ethic. It's got rock and roll in it. It's got some, a nod to Motown. The attitudes there, the songs are incredible. The Pretenders, of course, would go on to have many other hit songs and hit albums. But this song in particular, as their breakthrough single, is so influential. Brass in Pocket's unique mix of elements, the guitar, the vocal, drum groove, all combined in this cool, relaxed, confident song. It perfectly ushered in the 1980s. Chrissy Hine did eventually come around to appreciating this song, stating in 2002, but now I like the song because it's one of those songs that served me well. I didn't like my voice on it. I was kind of a new singer and listening to my voice made me kind of cringe. That feeling of cringing your early work because you were inexperienced is certainly a very relatable one. But then again, for most of us, our early work wasn't something as incredible as brass in pocket. Thank you ever so much. Please subscribe and hit the notification bell. And of course, watch the other videos in this series. Have a marvelous time and thank you ever so much for watching.